Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions, brought to you by AmericanManganeseInc.com. Here is Phil Mackesy. Author, entrepreneur, and blogger Garth Turner is back on This Week in Money. Garth's latest book is Money Road, Tools for the Wild Ride Ahead, and you can catch Garth's always interesting blog at greaterfool.ca. Garth, it's good to have you back. Well, thank you. Pleasure to be with you. You have not been on the road for a while, but you're in Vancouver this coming Monday, August 20th. It's sold out. No surprise to folks who uh, follow your blog. Man, all you got to do is read the headlines. Vancouver real estate market in full retreat. That's right. Well, yeah, it's interesting. Uh... I haven't, uh, yeah, I actually hadn't done a public speech in Vancouver for a couple of years, so uh, it was interesting to see the reaction. We've got tons of people coming out, I guess about 1,200 or more signed up before we had to cut it off. So, you know, there's obviously a healthy, morbid fascination with what's going on with the local real estate market, and I can truly understand that. What I've been forecasting for a while, and people said, ah, Garth, you're full of it. You know, it's different here in Vancouver and B.C. and the Okanagan and the Lower Mainland. It's never gone down. Everyone wants to live here. And I said, nope. It uh, the laws of economics will apply, and of course they've come home to roost like so many angry chickens, and now we're seeing a market that is in full retreat. Sales are down, prices are falling, uh, listings are going up. It's the classic situation mm-hmm. where you have a market that's starting to crumble, and of course the only real question is how long is it going to go on? How deep is the decline in activity going to be? And at the end of the day, where is the bottom going to end up? Because you certainly don't want to try to catch a falling knife and buy into a market like this if it's got quite a few years ahead of it. A lot of what's going on, uh, obviously one more sign of a global economic slowdown, Garth. Uh, Canada losing 30,000 jobs in July. And as you point out a couple of times, the worst thing possible for the real estate market is more folks without jobs. Yeah, it is. It takes a huge commitment to buy real estate because leverage is, is, is so high. You have to borrow so much money to get in at today's price levels. And nowhere in Canada is that more the case than, of course, in Vancouver and the Lower Mainland, the Okanagan. So, man, you just don't do that if you don't have real confidence in the future. And there's nothing that builds or tears down confidence more than whether you have or don't have a job. So the unemployment numbers were the biggest issue in the United States, keeping the real estate market down and falling. It wasn't you know, Wall Street falling over the financial markets or derivatives or anything like that. It was jobs. And when the U.S. unemployment rate spiked up beyond 9%, the real estate market crashed. Well, here in Canada, we've got our jobless numbers are going in the wrong direction. We've got 30,000 losses last month and the unemployment rate had climbed. Not good news. And in B.C. alone, we lost 15,000 jobs. Mm. So, it's not a good combination of the most expensive prices in the country and a labor market in distress. So there's more to come, Phil. Absolutely. Garth Turner, our guest on This Week in Money. Let's talk some specifics here in Vancouver. Our real estate prices down 16% in the last six months. Sales down by a third. And you're saying Vancouver is going to be hooped. Victoria, Parksville, Nanaimo, Okanagan, and the Fraser Valley. You're pretty frank about this. They're doomed. Yeah. I think it's... I mean, Vancouver is bad enough, but... There's more momentum, of course, in a large metropolitan area. Momentum on the upside, momentum on the downside. So you'll see very quick price deceleration happening in a large market that had quick price acceleration. So they're going to be fairly dramatic moves. Uh, Vancouver, though, may bounce out of this faster than areas like the Okanagan or on Vancouver Island, where you have a lower population base, uh, which is far more dependent upon jobs and migration. Uh, so there are different markets. Every real estate market is different. And right across the country, that's the case. You get into Toronto with 6 million people, you probably have 50 different markets going on at the same time. So people need to understand that where they live, real estate is intensely local. I, I'm quite uh, negative right now on what is going to happen up island, uh, north of uh, Victoria, up through Nanaimo, Parksville, Qualicum. I'm very concerned about Penticton, Kelowna, uh, Vernon, up through the, the whole Okanagan. Uh, I think those are areas that will have price deceleration, but then a fairly long period where prices will stagnate. Uh, and so it's just going to be a pretty, pretty bum market for a while. This sounds like a replay of the uh, U.S. experience, Garth. In many ways, it is. And of course, everybody has spent the past five years saying, oh, man, man we're different. Forget <laughs> it. Never going to happen here. Well, it is. 
right down to the extent that what I've written about lately, like the federal government trying to roll back these home equity lines of credit because Canadians have been using their homes just like bank accounts mm-hmm. exactly the same way the Americans did. So first, people borrow a ton of money, buy into a rising market, pay ridiculous prices for housing that, that they know they're buying at the top. And then they say, oh, my God, my house has gone up in value. I'm rich, rich now. They borrow against it to go and renovate or buy another home or buy a boat or something. And that's exactly the experience Americans went through, which decimated the middle class. Lo and behold, we're doing it, too. Toronto, we have some apocalyptic headlines here. A Toronto condo roller coaster peaks as Flaherty acts. Toronto condo sales cool as new mortgage rules bite. So obviously the uh, rules have got to be a factor. But so what's going on in the godless GTA? Yeah, actually, uh, GTA is interesting because it's the condo capital, not only of Canada, but it looks like the condo capital of the world. We have uh, 53,000 new condominiums just in the development process right now, which can't be stopped. So they will come to market. There's over 200 buildings being built. Uh, It's ridiculous. Uh, And already there are 18,500 brand new condos sitting vacant in downtown Toronto that were purchased pretty much by speculators Hmm. who thought, man, this is easy. I buy one of these things when it's first announced. I'll flip it when it's built, make a bunch of money. Well, now it's flipping time. And of course, the market is softening incredibly quickly. So we've got a situation now where condo sales have fallen by 50 percent. That's new condo sales. Uh, It's nothing short of a disaster. And meanwhile, of course, all these young kids who went and bought condos with nothing down, you know, 5 percent down that they got from the bank. So they got no skin in the game. They were under the impression that value is going to go up forever and they'll make money. And they've never been part of a down market. Well, no one knows how they're going to react when they wake up one day and they've lost all their meager equity and they now owe more money on the condo than they own and they can't sell the darn thing. No one knows precisely how they will react. If they start to bail and just get out at whatever cost, then you have more uh, impetus downward on the market. Don't Garth. know yet, Phil, but it's going to be an interesting few months. Garth Turner from GreaterFool.ca, our guest on This Week in Money. Always lots of humor and irony in the real estate business, Garth. No condo bubble in Toronto, uh, says RBC's Robert Hoag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You never ever feeling down. You just read some of these economic reports mm-hmm. and they put you into giggles. Uh, of course, the banks, you know, the big bank economists, some of them are pretty good eggs. But a lot of them, of course, they work for the banks. The banks have giant mortgage portfolios. They don't want to see the market crash and burn. Of course not. So you will get sort of Pollyanna-ish type statements. And, you know, my favorite is no U.S. style crash here. Well, <laughs> yeah, OK, fine. How about a Canadian style crash? That's going to be bad enough. And so I think that there's some misleading statements yeah. being put out precisely at the time when responsible people should be warning that anyone jumping into this market right now has a, quite a lot of risk ahead of them. You know, people complain about the stock market. When it goes down, they say, oh, my God, that's scary. It's risky. Well, when something goes down, it's actually less risk. When it goes up, it's more risk. Mm -hmm. And nothing has gone up more in the past 10 years than Canadian real estate, far above incomes. So real estate prices and debt have moved up lockstep, that is the definition of risk. I should mention uh, that it, there is good news in all this. If you live in Cornwall, Ontario, uh, a local newspaper reporting, uh, Cornwall fairly safe from cooling real estate market, and, and they're quoting <laughs> hey, agents. It's, it's different in Cornwall. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I know. It's it's human nature. Everybody wants to think sure. it's different when they're where they live. And you know, when I travel across the country, uh, it doesn't matter if it's Halifax, Ottawa, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, Kelowna, Burnaby. It doesn't matter. People think it's different yeah. there, uh, and that's why you know realtors hate me. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking to Garth Turner. It has been a month since our tiny elf and finance minister Jim Flaherty uh, killed the thirty-year mortgage, and here now comes. Page two, the second act, new underwriting guidelines from the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions. Let's go through the highlights, Garth. Yeah, yeah. The the, the banks, the bank regulator is uh, mandating some big changes that will have to happen by the end of October. I've already mentioned home equity lines of credit. Uh, it used to be you could get 85% of the value of your home and go and borrow it at prime. 
premium, which is cheap, and that was a good deal. Well, Flaherty rolled that back to 80%. Now the bank regulator is rolling it back to 65 That's a huge change. Mm-hmm. So it's going to mean a lot less money available uh, for people who want to borrow against their, their equity. Um, secondly, cash back mortgages. Big deal there. You know, you got a mortgage. It's from RBC or TD. They 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 kind of essentially give you a kickback. And that kickback you could then use for the down payment on a home. So that meant people got 100% financing. Well, that one's going to be gone too, thank goodness. Uh, another change is uh, new borrowers have to qualify for what's called the uh, Bank of Canada five-year rate, which right now is sitting at 5.44%. So they can't qualify for this you know, cheapo variable rate 3% loan. They have to qualify as if they were buying, uh, getting a loan at 5.44. So that's going to knock out a bunch of first-time buyers. And last major change, liar loans, mm. we call them in Canada, self-recognition mortgages. In the U.S., they were called liar loans. And that means you go into the bank, say, hey, I'm self-employed. My my income fluctuates. What am I supposed to do? Uh, just let me tell you what I think I'm going to make this year. Well, no, no more. Okay, banks used to do that, but you can't get a mortgage now unless you can actually prove with a statement from CRA what you're making. Okay. Big changes, Phil, and they're all going to slow things down. Tempting to blame F for all this, Garth. Uh, but how much of a factor is the market itself? How how would it be different without the new guidelines? Uh, I think what the government's been trying to do is to, to deflate this gas bag before it blows up, which is probably pretty smart. Uh, it will blow up. No market keeps going up. You just We've been in such an unhealthy real estate environment for the last number of years. It would blow up at some point. So the government's trying to you know suck air out of this thing before it, it actually gets to the critical point. It's a pretty delicate thing. I mean, at one point, do they slow it down? At what, what point do they make it worse and bring the, uh, the inevitable crash sooner? No one knows that. I can tell you developers, builders, home builders associations right now, they're kind of freaking out because they think this is way too much. And they know on the ground what's happening. Demand is just drying up quickly. So they're, needless to say, they're going to be blaming the government for having precipitated sure. a crash, which was certainly going to happen anyway. And the banks, of course, themselves are talking TD Economics, uh, saying tighter mortgage regulations are going to slow demand. And the new one, the uh, Scotiabank report, saying here's a kind of a scary one. The full impact of the slowdown won't be visible until uh, the, around 2015. You've been talking about this for a long time in your blog. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I've, I've said often there'll be a quick correction, maybe 15 percent drop across the board nationally. That'll be more like 40 percent in Vancouver. But there's going to be a quick drop across the board. And that's not the end of it. Then we're into a long period of time when there'll be a melt or a stagnation or a flatlining or worse in the market. So there won't be a drop and then a quick recovery and we go to new heights. Not going to happen. And we need to only look at the United States to see that right now they're in year number five, going into year number six of their melt. Uh, That's really the pattern that we should reasonably expect. Don't want to act as a spoiler here, but uh, give us a sense of what we can do to protect ourselves from this, besides selling our house and renting. Well, diversification is a big deal, and I do think we everyone's got to be mindful of that. If all your eggs are in one basket, you have accelerated your risk, uh, and therefore, you should, if you can, sell now and still get a decent price and downsize. If you've been thinking about it anyway, fine. If you're a young couple, you know, lusting for a new place, just sit on it. Uh, do something else lustful instead, uh, <laughs> because there are lots of better alternatives right now than getting into the housing market. Uh, if you've been afraid of uh, investing money, you've got it sitting in GICs and your savings account, you know, get out there, get some investing done, because actually the financial markets right now hold more mm-hmm. promise and I think less risk than the real estate market. We talk about how much irony there is in real estate. Here's one that just caught my attention. I don't know, just just seemed to be kind of funny. The Quebec Federation of Real Estate Boards, uh, representing the province's 15,000 realtors, is threatening to pull out of the CREA. They've got their own separatist movement going there. Well, what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> I was in Quebec uh, last week, and I tell you, the province is blanketed with part Quebecois election signs, they definitely have been the first off the mark and the most aggressive. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm kind of expecting there's going to be a 
a shakeup there in that uh, political environment. Not great for sure if you own real estate in Montreal. So I think the Quebec real estate board is probably, uh, you know, symptomatic of that, that they think they can do it better themselves. Maybe they can. I'm not too mightily impressed with Korea myself. Author, blogger, financial advisor, and entrepreneur Garth Turner is our guest. You can find Garth on the web at greaterfool.ca. His latest is Money Road, Tools for the Wild Ride Ahead. Hey, Garth, thanks for talking to us, and best of luck on Monday. Pleasure as always, Phil. Thank you. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. David Galland is Managing Director of Casey Research. He's also Managing Editor for the Casey Report, and he contributes to Casey's Daily Dispatch. He is online at caseyresearch.com. Hey, David, it's good to have you back on This Week in Money. Nice to be back. Great to hear that that wasn't you in the Spokane police incident uh, recently. Tell us the story here. What happened? Well, it was sort of uh, ironic, I think, uh, or, or highly coincidental, is that uh, uh, there was a fellow by the same name and then San the same age who uh, was driving a car, I guess, with these sovereign license plates on them, which says basically that they're not going to pay attention to the state, and was uh, stopped and, and uh, swarmed by the police. Hmm. And, uh, and um, I mean, it's it just a huge police reaction, which is very typical these days. But the funny thing or the ironic thing about it was just the... Literally the week before, I had written an article about <coughs> called "Paying Lip Service to Liberty," uh, where the basic theme was is that going out of your way to pick a fight uh, in defense of liberty, so to speak, is is a fairly misguided thing to do. And so, driving around with sovereign license plates on, which are you know, not issued by any state, is is one of those actions that would get you get you uh, unfavorable attention. And so, so the fellow did. But it was. It was ironic because he had the same name and, and the same age. Interesting that uh, that these guys practically put a target on the back of their vehicle. Also interesting when you watch the uh, Spokane TV video is the amazing number of police vehicles. The the huge overreaction by the by the police here. Well, America has become highly militarized in terms of I mean the police force at this point. Uh, you, you any any place you go at this point, you'll see it. Even in the small town that we live here in 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 the north uh, the northeast. Well, ski town has got a huge uh, homeland security office, if you will, with I think there's something like 30 police in a little ski town, and and you know the biggest crime here is people stealing, uh, you know, walking ski wax. people's skis once yeah. in a while. So, uh, but we were down in New York recently, and and a couple of occasions we came across uh, look like those sort of platoon-sized brigades of of uh, uh, militarized police. I mean, dressed in the full SWAT outfits, mm-hmm. all sporting machine guns. And, uh, I mean, like they were getting ready for a major attack, and this is just sort of business as usual at this point. Interesting that uh, that this has given rise to a, a, a prank called swatting. How does that work? <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I have no real experience with it, but the, uh, apparently people have taken to calling 911 and reporting uh, uh, incidents that you know, sound serious, like home invasions and this sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Other people's houses, uh, hopefully when they're not there, and just, just to enjoy the sight of you know, a couple dozen uh, SWAT team members swarm <laughs> into a house. So it, of course, is an extraordinarily stupid thing to do because at some point somebody's going to get shot and then uh, yeah. it, would, it wouldn't end well for the prankster, I can assure you. David Galland from Casey Research, our guest here on This Week in Money. Worst drought in over half a century uh, in the U.S. It's killing corn prices. President Obama announcing emergency measures, but stopping short of waiving that uh, 40% ethanol requirement. We have some good news if you're growing corn or soybeans. The forecast calling uh, for showers and cooler temps in the Midwest, but the damage has been done. And uh, Bud Conrad is asking, will the crop crisis trigger inflation? Well, uh, you know, every these things, I mean, inflation, uh, they, they, they'll trigger price increases, no question, uh, especially if they continue to, to sidetrack the corn and the ethanol. Um, but, um, you know, inflation is a monetary phenomenon, and, uh, and you know, but higher prices because uh, supply and demand dynamics are a different thing. But one thing that is sort of interesting, and people, of course, the enviro alarmists are you know, saying, oh, this is a pure, sure sign of global warming, mm-hmm. and, you know, of course, man-made global warming, and but uh, they don't mention that in Europe it's been one of the coldest winters, sorry, coldest summers uh, in, in, in recent memory. So, you know, weather is a, you know, it's, it's weather. It's not, uh, this doesn't mean it's the end of the world. It just means there's been a shift in the weather pattern. And that is obviously going to affect food prices. Bud says here, I think higher food prices are part of our future. And probably for a number of reasons, but uh, not necessarily, not necessarily. I mean, there's, 
there have been some some severe weather conditions over the last few years. You know, we've had this sort of global food shortages on a couple of occasions. You 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 do have uh, an awful lot of people, um, you know, coming into the world who want to eat better. You know, especially in the third world. Um, and the gains, you know, the tremendous gains were made by crop modification. Um, those are definitely leveling out. And so we're starting, you know, this, this has sort of been the third, call it, food crisis in the last uh, five years. And that is, you know, that's something to pay attention to. I think agriculture in certain parts of it will be a very, a very interesting play. Are we going to have the same impact uh, of food shortages in the U.S. that, that uh, Bud points out we'd be having in places like North Africa? I, I, I don't see it. I mean, you know, my Bud and I had debate about this on occasion, but I'm, I'm looking over my backyard here, and I don't see crops growing. So, <laughs> you know, things will get real serious when I have to start planting my own crops. We are talking to David Galland from KC Research here on This Week in Money. Hey, we know it's summertime and volume is low. Stocks are moving sideways uh, for the last little while. Investors obviously spooked by what's going on in Europe and wondering when the next load of financial heroin is getting here. Yes. And uh, it will come, but I think I do think people. I think the people are expecting it a bit too soon. I think that in reality, you've got <clears throat> the Fed is going to have to be very, very careful here because you know there's they are the emperor without any clothes. I mean, the only clothes they've got is well, they have to, they have no clothes. But the policy tools um, they're starting to run low on them, and uh, so they for them to come back in the market with a big QE program mm-hmm. if it didn't work. Um, would which it won't would be a, a real problem, and you know once once people lose faith in the Fed, uh, and remarkably they still have faith in the Fed, um, then the game really starts to change. And and I you know I, I do believe we'll see the end of the fiat currencies in this in this cycle. Uh, it, it's not going to happen overnight, but it's going to happen over the next you know, uh, something's got to happen in the next four years, five okay. years. Uh, there's no question about it. So. But I do think I do think the Fed's going to be very cautious about <laughs> about you know firing their last bullet, if you will, with with another big QE. In the short term, uh, Ben Bernanke uh, at the Fed's annual conference in Jackson Hole at the end of the month. Maybe he'll tease us. Maybe he won't. Uh, meanwhile, ECB President Mario Draghi says he's going to start buying bonds again, but not before September. I guess the markets are going to be pretty disappointed when they figure that out. Yeah, but it won't make any difference whether they buy stuff or don't buy stuff. I mean, they're, they're, at some point, the, at some point, you just can't kick the can any further down the road, and they've. They've done a commendable job, and uh, there's, there's no question. I mean, commendable in, in the sense that they're they're pursuing their aims and they're doing it without any any uh, principles really, other than just saving their their rear ends. Um, but uh, but at some point, the game has to stop, and I and I do think we're gonna we're gonna see the end of it. Certainly, uh, certainly in the next it's got to be four or five years. David is Bernanke down to his last bullet. You know, he's getting pretty close. The one thing you can't. I mean, the one thing that you can people do. Or, and, I, and we all make the same mistake. We, you underestimate the power of government. And the things that are obvious and what I call the easy solutions, you know, uh, ginning up uh, trillions of dollars to, to spend, you know, in, in, uh, you know out, of no, out of thin air and to buy toxic uh, mortgages or, or the stuff they've been doing, that's the, sort of the, the easy, friendly uh, policy options. You know, once you get past a certain point, and, the, and they become truly desperate. Then we'll start seeing things like you know uh, exchange controls, and you'll you'll and which you know in the states we we have pretty much uh, there's a lot of actions they take that make it very hard to move money out of the country. But um, you know the, the you really can't anticipate how how far over the edge they can go, and you just have to look at a place like Argentina, which I happen to love mm-hmm. um, the country. But the government there is a good example of how desperate governments can become, and once they become that desperate, they will do things like nationalize the pensions. Uh, you know, uh, at what point in the U.S. will the U.S. simply say that <laughs> all money in, in retirement plans needs to be converted into the safety of U.S. Treasury bills, or people have to take the money out and pay the tax? I mean, there's this sort of thing that, you know, is still in the future. So, um, you know, they, can, they, they, still have policy, they still have bullets to fire, but they become increasingly less effective and, and increasingly more draconian. Let's push ahead to the end of August. Bernanke comes out of Jackson Hole and says, no more QE3. What's that going to do to markets? Well, he won't. He, he won't say that. Uh, he'll say, he'll couch it in terms such as, you know, uh, they'll do whatever it takes, you know, and they're remaining watchful. I mean, you know, uh, central bankers, uh, and then, you know, if central bankers in the past have admitted this, they're, you know, a big part of their job is to lie. Sure. I mean, it's, it's, 
you know, if if Bernanke came out and actually told the truth at any time in the last few years, people would have panicked. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but we have a real problem here, and it's uh, so he's not going to he's not going to say anything to upset the market. He's not going to he'll he'll just come out and say you know we're still pondering or we're looking at it or whatever. But I, I don't think that the next uh, I, th- I think before the elections, you know, they may do something, but okay. if they did, it would be a lot closer to the election. David Galland is Managing Director of Casey Research, and he's online at caseyresearch.com. Hey, check out the next Casey Research Sprott Global Summit, Navigating the Politicized Economy. That's in Carlsbad, California, September 7th to 9th. Great lineup here. Doug Casey, Bud Conrad, uh, Eric Sprott, Rick Rule, Marin Katusa, Louis James, Bob Hoy. It is almost a complete sellout. Give us a, a sneak preview of what's going to be going on there, David. Well, I think the key thing is, and this is sort of a personal epiphany, if you will, is that we really are, the the world is in the grips of central planners. And, you know, they call it this and they call it that. But in reality, what's happening now is there's an increasingly, you know, the small group of people at the core of, you know, certainly in Europe, uh, certainly in the States at this point, uh, Canada, everywhere else, where, where essentially you have bureaucrats making decisions about, you know, in, in such a way to influence the economy this way or the other. And it's gotten to the point now where there really is the market, the free market has pretty much been disabled uh, in favor of the central planners. So it's a, it's a, the sort of thing that people need to get their heads around, that there is no sort of moral guiding principles here. It is simply whatever the politicians think is going to get them you know, reelected and get them down the, down the road. So it's a whole different environment, and you hear this more and more from people that they don't trust the stock market. There's been a big exodus of the stock market out of the stock market with from you know just regular old investors. Um, you know the high frequency trading. You 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 see all these signs of the sort of the the corruption and the and the control and in the fact that let's say John Corzine, uh, you know who was who oversaw the the uh, MF Global to mm-hmm. fiasco, hasn't been charged with anything. You know, he's missing almost two billion dollars, and you know there's, there's, nobody's been charged. So there's, we've come into a whole different kind of economy here, and it really is a centrally planned economy. It is, uh, it is politicized. So uh, our conference is really to tell people, you know, sort of show them all the different ways this is affecting markets, and and give them strategies that they can use that um, that, that can survive in this sort of environment, uh, including strategies that allow them to invest completely outside of the uh, traditional markets. All the information on the next Casey Research Sprott Global Summit, Navigating the Politicized Economy, is at CaseyResearch.com. Hey, David, it's always good to talk to you. Thanks for this. Likewise. I'm glad to talk to you. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Tim Wood publishes Cycles, News, and Views. Tim covers the stock market, gold, oil and gas, treasuries, and the U.S. dollar. Hey, the September issue of Cycles, News, and Views is out soon. If you want more on Tim's work with Dow Theory and the Cycle Turn Indicator, that's easy. Visit CyclesMan.net. Tim, how are you doing? I'm good, Phil. And you? I am fine. We're enjoying our summer. For our radio friends who have not met you before, uh, tell us what Dow Theory does and how it helps you understand the market. And then we're going to talk about what's going on with the various Dow averages. So what is Dow Theory? Phil, Dow Theory is... Actually, it's it's the methods that were, dis- I guess you would say, um, discovered is not the right word, but the methods employed by Charles H. Dow back in the late 1800s to help him read market conditions, to read, it was his stock market barometer, so to speak. And it, it, it a lot of people think that it has to do with the transports, the utilities, and the industri- industrials, but it's not. It's just the transports and the uh, industrials. Uh, proof of that is is that throughout his writings, when you look at the writings, he talks about the averages, and he refers to the industrials and the transports. Nowhere does he mention the utilities, and the other proof to that is is that the utilities didn't even come to be until I believe it was 28 or 29. I think it was 1929. Okay. The utility average didn't even, didn't even exist. So what Dow Theory is, though, is it's a it's a reading of how one average confirms the other, and you know it has to do with movement above and below the previous secondary high and low point, and that's where the art does come in with Dow theory, identifying those secondary high and low points. One thing that I have been able to do from being a cycles person, which has nothing to do with Dow theory okay. uh, directly, is that I have 
uh, I'm able to quantify, and all cycles work is is a, is a method of trend quantification. So I have been able to use that cycles work, and what I have found is that my intermediate term tops and bottoms tend to coincide with the um, uh, secondary high and low points in accordance with Dow theory. So where Dow theory did not give us a method of identifying those points, the cycles work gives us a, a way to do that. Um, and with much more clarity, and it's a statistical-based uh, method of doing that. So that gives us a leg up on our Dow theory. Now, where we're at, <clears throat> last uh, August, we I don't know if people, have, you know, we have such short-term memories, <laughs> but last August, uh, you may remember the market melted down and went down into the October lows, but last August, we moved below the June lows on both averages, and the June lows last year, 2011, that marked uh, a, a secondary low point. And so according to Dow Theory, once the averages move either above or below, whichever the case may be, a previous secondary high or low point, then what they call a primary trend change is triggered. Well, in this case, with us moving below the June lows, that triggered a primary bearish trend change. And that primary bearish trend change has been in effect all the way up from the October bottom. Um, we had another uh, confirmation of that uh, in April whenever or may whenever we broke below the previous secondary low point which on the industrials occurred looking at a chart in april and the previous secondary low point on the transports occurred in march so when we broke below those lows back in may we had another uh, or reconfirmation if you will of that primary bearish trend change and so what that tells us is is that this warning is that it's a warning that this rally out of the october low is suspect just like we've said all along okay now the dow theory is proving that and we have a, a series of non-confirmations we have three degrees of non-confirmations going on um uh, we have the non-confirmation that occurred between the july high last year and then the, the most recent high that occurred back in uh um uh, well, May on the industrials, looking at it on a closing basis, and then that high occurred, uh, I believe it was early February on the transports, so that's one level. Then we have the non-confirmation that occurred between the February and the May high, and now we have a non-confirmation that's occurred uh, throughout the month of June and July and into August. So we have three different levels of non-confirmation. And, you know, that doesn't mean necessarily that it's a death sentence to the market, but what the old-timers would say, the, uh, the Dow Theory founding fathers, is that, you know, it's a warning. Let the market alone, they would say. And there's all kinds of quotes in some of Robert Ray's material where he talked about these non-confirmations. It's clearly not a positive thing. So when you look at the Dow Theory and the fact that we have these non-confirmations, we have this existing primary bearish trend change from last August, we have the secondary primary trend change from uh, back in May, and then this non-confirmation, it's screaming, mm -hmm. warning, warning, warning. And so now what we're looking for is the technical setup um, to actually give us the trigger um, to mark the decline, which I believe will be the decline into the phase two low, according to Dow Theory. Um, and, and when I say mark the decline into the phase two low, uh, backing up and looking at it, the, the uh, decline into the 2009 low, I believe, was the phase one low. There's always a rally separating phase one from phase two. I think that's what's been going on since 2009. And now we're having this non-confirmation and all this stuff starting to occur. So now we're looking for those DNA markers, the statistical-based markers, the structural-based markers, um, in accordance with my other work, to give us the setup. And once that setup is in place, I think we're going to see the decline into the phase two low. Of, the, of, of what is an ongoing, long-term, secular bear market. We're talking to Tim Wood from Cycles News and Views here on This Week in Money. Speaking of warnings, Tim, the uh, Dow Transports, down 5% off that May high, more than 10% off the high from last year. Now, a lot of folks say transportation is a leading economic indicator. What should we make of those numbers? What kind of warning is this? Well, I don't look at it in a, in a percentage because it actually, when you read the original writings, that's the beauty of having this original material. Robert Ray talked about it, uh, and he said, you know, uh, uh, one point is as good as 100. Either it's confirmed or it didn't. And um, we have the non-confirmation. So, it, you know, the percentage of non-confirmation is really meaningless. Um, the fact that we have a non-confirmation, it's, it's, it's as good being a point as it is 100, so it doesn't matter. Um, and that's straight from 
like I said, the, the, the readings from the Dow Theory founding father, specifically Robert Ray. Tim, I guess it depends on whether you're a bull or a bear. A bull seem to be worried about the divergence here, but most bears seem to think it is not a big deal. Well, I think the bears may think it's not a big deal because it's it's talking their book. Sure. You know, or, you know and uh, that may be the reason. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, what I have, you know, a Dow Theory non-confirmation, sure, it can always be corrected. Absolutely. You know, and we talked about this last year, uh, all Dow Theory non-confirmations, it's not, all of them are not created equally, meaning that, you, you know, just because you get one doesn't mean it can't be corrected. Just because you get a Dow Theory buy or sell signal doesn't mean the market, or I say buy or sell signal, excuse me, that's what people call it that, but a, a Dow Theory primary trend change doesn't mean that the market's necessarily going to go up and up and up forever and ever or down. Sure. And as you may recall, in fact, we did, I did a study last year when we had that primary trend change back in August, remember that last year? Yeah. And I came out and I said, wait a minute, no, none of the other DNA markers are in place. The market's moving into a secondary low point, and once that secondary low point is, 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 is made, not only are we going up, but we're going back up above the May 2011 highs. And so, and, and that was based on the statistical aspect from the other work, and it was exactly right. Now, in it doing that, it has created this this longer term. Uh, I say longer term. This this three diff- this, this non confirmation at these three different levels. And so again, now what we're looking for is the DNA markers and the setup. We got to get that setup in place. And once that setup is in place, it, I, I, you know I, the inevitable is going to unfold. Tim, tell us how your work with the cycle turn indicator kind of overlays what's going on with Dow Theory. The Dow. <laughs> Again, the cycle turn indicator, the words cycle and Dow Theory do not go together. Okay. They do not they do not have they they are they are mute they are they are separate tools. It's like a hammer and a screwdriver. Okay. Okay, I mean all right, but the thing is with the cycles is that it gives us a way to quantify what otherwise is unquantifiable through just Dow Theory. Because like I said, the the intermediate term high and low points and the intermediate term movements according to the cycles work, is the same as the secondary, what they call uh, secondary or primary movements within, uh, within Dow Theory, and the movements into the secondary high and low points is the same as the intermediate term high and low points from a cyclical perspective. So the cycle turn indicator helps us to identify those lows, and the statistics help us to understand when those lows or highs are going to occur. And so with the, with the expectation from a, st- a statistical-based expectation, and then with the cycle turn indicator turning and helping us identify them, it gives us an edge that nobody else has on this, on this Dow Theory stuff. The Dow Theory, it's, it's kind of the broad, paints the broad strokes. That's our backdrop. Okay. And then we work within the confines of that with our statistical base work. Speaking of an edge that nobody else has, Tim, were you the first guy to come up with this concept of DNA markers? I don't know. That's just something, I guess so. That's just okay. something that my analytical brain thought of, and I didn't know what else to call it. Because in identifying, give you another example. The top in 2000, I went through and I looked at every four-year cycle top going back to 1896, which is the inception of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And I saw a common denominator. I said, well, okay, every time it tops in this manner, this is what happened. And in that case, every time it had topped in that manner with those DNA, with that particular setup, it went below the previous four-year cycle low, which was the 1998 low in the 2000, uh, the decline into the 2002 four-year cycle low did go below the 98 low. And so I just kind of coined the phrase DNA marker. There's also a DNA marker or a common denominator. That's all I mean when I say DNA markers are common denominator. Have a checklist, just like I used last year. When we moved down into that October low, um, you know, starting in August, I said, no, we're fishing for, for an intermediate term low, and the reason is um, our DNA markers aren't in place. And when I say DNA markers, all I'm saying is it's a statistical based common denominator that occurs at, you know, whatever uh, inflection point of whatever degree. And so <clears throat> that's how I was able to make that call and saying that we would move back above the May 2011 high, which we have. Okay, well, now we're looking for a different set of DNA markers to mark this, this longer term, uh, this longer term top. You know, we've been looking for them. We know they exist. We know the history shows that every major top since 1896 has had these. But until it happens, statistically speaking, we probably don't have that top. So again, that's what we're looking for and we're starting to see uh, that materialized, and, and the key is 
is, you know, we got to dot every I and cross every T. Once sure. that happens, you know, the fate's been set. It's done. And so that's what we're looking for. That's the beauty of this work is it takes the feeling out, by and large, because you have something tangible, some statistics and a checklist, so to speak, that you look for and you say, well, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, that one did, that one did, or it didn't, and then that gives you some guidance. Tim Wood from Cycles News and Views, our guest here on This Week in Money. And pretty hard to ignore the uh, market fundamentals here, Tim. The U.S. economy is struggling. Europe, a basket case. China's industrial growth is slowing. That's got to affect markets heading into the fall. What do you think that's going to do, uh, especially to the Dow transports? Well, <clears throat> Phil, uh, William Peter Hamilton. The lineage goes like this. You had, it was uh, Robert, I mean, excuse me, uh, Charles Dow developed his theories. He died in 1902. Um, he wrote in the Wall Street Journal, founder of the Wall Street Journal, founder of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. He wrote about his theories uh, until his death in 1902. Following him was the guy by the name of William Peter Hamilton, who carried his work further, actually published some books about his work. Uh, into, I think, 1929. I think he died right after the 29 crash. And following him was Robert Ray. And Robert Ray really did more for Dow Theory than anything. And, and, I mean, he wrote more material. So that's the lineage. But here's the deal. Um, Dow said that he called it, or excuse me, he called it the stock market barometer. And William Peter Hamilton wrote a book, and it's called the stock market barometer. And so <clears throat> what you're saying fundamentally, the industrials and the transports with the non-confirmations and the, and the primary trend change, it's telling us that. And, they, and, and back then, I guess the barometer was kind of a high-tech instrument, and, they, and he actually said somewhere, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's used, to, it, when you see this happening, they said it's a forecasting stormy economic condition. Hmm. It wasn't directly used as a tool to, to forecast the stock market, per se, but, it, 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 you know, and the word he used was stormy economic conditions. So it fits. The Dow theory is telling us exactly what the fundamentals will see in. And now, like I said, we look for this statistical stuff to fall in place. My guest is Tim Wood from Cycles News and Views, the September issue of Cycles News and Views. Coming out soon. If you want to subscribe and get the benefit of Tim's analysis, visit cyclesman.net. That's cyclesman.net. And if you want to get in touch with Tim, that's simple, too. It's Tim at cyclesman.net. Tim, always fascinating, always interesting. Good to talk to you, sir. Good to talk to you, Phil, and thank you for having me. Thanks to our guests, Garth Turner, David Galland, and Tim Wood. And thanks to you for listening. I'm Phil Mackesy for AmericanManganeseInc.com. We're back next week with another edition of This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.